that's a sort of an example of an innovation that's really exciting to me that can, you know, that can happen relatively quickly when the right sort of the right kit, the right people um, with, the, you know, trying to sort of solve the right problem all sort of come together. My guest today is Angela Ryan. Angela has decades of experience across the health system as a clinician, health informatician and executive leading large-scale programs and policy reform at state and federal levels. She's a founding fellow, former vice chair and non-executive director of the Australian Institute of Digital Health, former president of the Australasian College of Health Informatics and formerly chief clinical information officer at the Australian Digital Health Agency. In 2021, Angela was the recipient of the inaugural Brilliant Women in Digital Health Award and in 2017 was awarded a Churchill Fellowship through World Leading Research into Patient Safety. She recently joined Oracle Health as a lead healthcare executive for JPAC, her first foray into the private sector. Welcome to Hacking Health. This podcast is for future-focused health experts thought leaders and change makers who are interested in making health accessible for everyone because together we can get to the future faster. How do you stay productive and organised in your daily routine? Uh, I guess in the ideal state, I, you know, try and set goals for each day and prioritise uh, that's a sort of fairly constant activity because, as you would be aware, no two days ever look the same and most days don't look the same uh, at the end of the day as to how you might have sort of anticipated it. I also try and exercise. The exercise really energises me and I try and do that sort of right at the beginning of the day if that's at all possible. Uh, one of the other principles I have is sort of, well, it's, and this is a work in progress, is learning to say no. Uh, that's not always entirely practical, particularly if things just need to get done. Uh, and we can do things in a sort of somewhat organic way here at Oracle Health at times too. I also, I do genuinely try and sort of reflect on, you know, what's gone well, what hasn't gone so well, and sort of try and uh, continue to sort of incorporate that into my practice. But, you know, that's, you know, that's a bit of a work in in progress, I guess, because in the end, you know, you 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 want to try not to be too hard on yourself. Uh, that's a sort of a, a lifelong commitment I have. Um, you know, you, and you don't always you don't always succeed with that, but you know, it's just important to remember not to be too hard. Yeah, but I think that reflecting is important as well. So I guess it's the lens that you put over that reflection on what you want to. I I think. I think of it as start, stop, keep. So what do I want to stop doing? What do I want to keep doing? What do I want to start, stop, keep? I don't know. I lost my train <laughs> of thought there. But, yeah, and I think setting boundaries is a really big one too around that. But if you're setting goals and have like a overall bigger goals, you can always use that to set the boundaries, I think, too. Like Absolutely. use the goals. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you there. We're separately no, recorded. I was going to say the boundaries are, are really critical. I think, you know, obviously you can have sort of a series of gates, I guess. These are the things that I'll, you know, I can move around. These are the things I can consider. These are the things that I'll absolutely not 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 shift on. But that's, you know, that's again, that's that's a bit of a work in progress. It's it's a fairly dynamic process, really. I agree. <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit about what Oracle Health is and what you do there? Oracle is a giant. I, I joined Oracle Health in September last year. Now, this is a really big gear change for me because I have not worked in the private sector before. So it's been a bit of a learning process for me. I think, I guess, what drew me to the challenge was just, well, well, the ability to kind of perform in a very different environment and mm -hmm. one that I hadn't worked in before. But I think also what drew me to Oracle Health specifically was, you know, their recent acquisition of Cerna, uh, the degree to which Oracle Tools could really, I think, bring about and accelerate the next generation 
of EMRs, you know, that, that sort of speed and scale to modernise and obviously particularly with AI. I think certainly a good example of this is a relatively new tool called the Clinical Digital Assistant. That's a product that's currently under development. It was announced in September last year. It's already in beta testing in the US and it's looking likely to come to market here locally anyway, probably later this year. But it's essentially a um, generative AI tool that's integrated with the EMR. It's, um, you know, an ambient listening device. It, it sort of um, listens to, to simple commands and then it will um, provide context-aware actions. So what we hope it will do is that it will, you know, really support clinicians uh, mm. and minimise burden, um, which is, a, as we know, is a, a really significant issue, particularly when it comes to, to EMRs. So I think that's a really good example of something that can come to market relatively quickly mm. can be scaled you know that's not to say that all of the right gates won't sit around um how the product will be developed and tested and and all the rest of it particularly with respect to safety but i think that's a sort of an example of an innovation that's really exciting to me that can you know that can happen relatively quickly when the right sort of the right kit the right people uh, with, you know, trying to sort of solve the right problem all sort of come together. And I mm. think the other thing I'd say about Oracle is that it's it's not just the EMR, you know, it's EMR, it's the Health Information Exchange, it's Population Health, and then there's ERP, Human Capital Management, there's Cloud, there's sort of all these other tools that can kind of come together as one, under under one roof. So I think... It's so much more than just an EMR these days. And I know that's where a lot of the narrative is going, particularly in digital health, but I feel like this is sort of somewhere where I can, you can kind of be at the centre at where that there's just so much more opportunity. And I think the only other thing I would say is that, well, aside from being surrounded by really excellent people, I knew some of them when I came on board, but yeah. um, before I came on board, but... I work with a group of clinicians and we work sort of internally across all the lines of business and then we also work client facing so we work i i get to continue to work with you know people who are doing great work in health services and i guess having that ability to continue to make a difference and have some sort of tiny impact on health reform so that sort of allows me to do that so I guess that's kind of why I'm here um, yeah. um, and why why I've made this change at this stage. Yeah, that's awesome. That AI project is amazing. I had a call with somebody, a non-client, the other day, and this AI read thing was in the Zoom discussion and afterwards I got an email with the summary of the call. So it's, I guess it's similar to that, isn't it? And it meant neither of us had to take notes and that, and it gave us the action items afterwards. So I was like, oh, I better diarise those now that I've got those. Yeah. So, yeah, it was incredible. Yeah. It's pretty wild, isn't it? I guess what sort of, I mean, it's it's both exciting and daunting. Yes. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, that sort of, that kind of recording can happen very quickly and then, mm. and, and say, in the case of the tool I was talking about, it then can generate you know, notes, it can generate next steps, it can order an appointment, a drug yes. or whatever, but, uh, and all the while building a clinical note. But I guess the, you know, the the sort of, the slightly kind of, well, the clinician in me and the sort of person who's very concerned with safety goes, okay, well, this is really excellent, but we've got to make sure that, you know, it's the, the language that's being generated, that yes. the, um, uh, the information that's part of that clinical note, you know, the clinician still understands they have to be reviewing that. Yes. To, you know, ultimately sign off on that before it goes inside someone's notes. So yes. I think tech, tech's really cool like that. It can really help, but um, it Can't. also can lead sometimes down a path of least resistance. So yeah. It's yeah. Just, you know, being careful. Still need to be mindful of it. Yes. Are there any specific projects or achievements that you are particularly proud of? Okay, so I would say professionally, looking back, I would say the National Digital Health Workforce and Education Roadmap, um, which was a, 
which I guess was the first of its kind um, that I led the development of at the Australian Digital Health Agency. And I think, you know, I guess what, you know, the opportunity it gave me was to consult right across the sector. So we worked with governments, to consumers, to clinicians, clinical peaks. We worked with the industry. We worked with researchers and academics. And I think it was in the end, ultimately, what we were trying to do was find a roadmap to better equipping the health workforce in the use of digital health tools and technologies. I think what we ultimately came up with was really tangible and practical and and ultimately really necessary. I think, you know, th there's over a million people in, in, in the health workforce and we've all got very disparate, very distinct, uh, very unique needs. So I guess what we what we tried to do was was find something that would kind of align mm. with where it might fit within that sort of within the well not just the workforce but the, but the education sector more broadly the the other thing that sort of fell out of that was the national um, nursing midwifery digital health capability framework uh, we worked very hard on finding very long names to uh, describe all of the strategies that we were developing um, but that that was sort of a I guess a real passion project for me as a nurse that was something I was really dedicating to wanting to see um, come to fruition. And again, we engaged right across the nursing midwifery sector and more broadly. And I think what stands out for me with that product is, is that it persists today. So it's, you know, it's still, it's still being used alongside the roadmap and it still has value. So I think, you know, I'm pretty, pretty happy about that. So personally, um, I would say that the Churchill Fellowship is another real highlight for me. So I was awarded that in 2017 and it's a really competitive process. I don't know if you know much about it, but I'd certainly encourage any of your listeners who might be interested to give it a go because there's absolutely nothing like it. You can effectively, you devise a project, uh, well, rather an idea and a project around that uh, and I guess prosecute that case, and and um, if you're lucky enough, then then you'll be awarded one. But then you get the ability to travel essentially wherever it is that you need to travel. In my case, it was to ten different cities in three different countries. I met with Incredible. hundreds of people, lots of extraordinary leaders uh, in their respective fields, and then uh, have the ability to sort of bring about some kind of change uh, on the return. So I, I guess. Probably what stands out for me about that experience is just the, the generosity of the people I met along the way who were just really kind and willing to give up their time to help me learn. So, um, yeah, that's been another real highlight. And what was your project? Uh, so I was looking at, I guess, what is the ideal model to implement digital health safely from a governance perspective? So... It essentially was looking at, well, what are the things that we need to be thinking about? Where do they sit? Who looks after them? Because uh, ultimately what we are trying to do, I guess, is is better the health system, but do it as safely as we can. Mm. So I guess the model that I, uh, you know, ended up deriving was very much influenced well obviously by the people I met in those three countries but mm -hmm. it was also loosely based on uh, a model that had gone for in the US mm -hmm. um, a national sort of safety center there I think what's interesting though on my return and a, and a real learning for me was that it, it's in the timing so I you yes. know, I, I came up with a model uh, I worked with governments to to sort of implement components of it I did, I was lucky enough to be able to speak with Julia Gillard um, as, as one of the people I um, interviewed. And I did that because obviously she's had quite a bit of experience in implementing large scale policy reform. Yes. And she said to me, there are three things, there are kind of three ingredients to successfully implementing um, policy, um, policy reform, particularly at scale, you need to have the right message it needs to be to the right audience and it needs to be at the right time. So if those three things don't line up, then you'll struggle. So, you know, the best message in the world to the best audience 
is time wonderful, is wrong. but if the timing isn't mm. right, um, it doesn't work. So I think, you know, that that was something I really took away from that experience with her and it's kind of emboldened me as I've gone forward. But, yeah, look, it was it was terrific, absolutely terrific. Excellent. Great story and great opportunity for other people with big ideas as well. Yes, indeed. Looking back, is there anything that you wish you'd known at the start of your career? I think what I would say to that is I wish I'd known that it was okay to trust myself more, not to be so hard on myself. I think that is in part the nature of being a woman um, Mm -hmm. and the environment in which we uh, socialised, you know, certainly that was my experience growing up. I think, you know, we look to younger generations who view the world through a very different lens and particularly younger women, and I think that's progress that we can be proud of. But, you know, that being said, equity generally and gender-based discrimination um, remain significant challenges, and I think we know how much this is challenged within sort of society more broadly. So I suppose that's something that we can never really take our sort of gazed away from, if you like, we have to stay very focused and committed. Mm. Uh, You know, we can't sit back and just hope that progress will persist without ongoing effort. Mm. It's a good message. Are there any specific skills or knowledge areas you've focused on developing? Well, certainly it's tricky in health to sort of, well, with anything, I guess, but it's tricky to stay across everything because Mm. the environment's so dynamic. There's so much change. There's so much information. There's so much to to just stay abreast of. Um, I think for me, staying across changes that are sort of occurring in how we deliver healthcare, and I'm, I'm not just talking about technology here. Obviously, that's critical, although hard to stay on top of. But policy reform, because obviously that will really influence the way in which will both funding flows, but also how services will evolve or or sort of continue to deliver. So it's kind of understanding, I guess, where those particular policy reforms might be occurring um, and how then they might influence um, how we deliver care. And I suppose one example would be the the government's recently published digital health blueprint. Mm -hmm. So that was published toward the end of last year. So that really, you know, gives the reader an indication of uh, where the priorities will be and how, you know, the policies will be uh, developed accordingly. And then ultimately how that influences me as um, not just a healthcare professional, but but also as a a, um, consumer. Mm. Well, while we're on digital health, Can you tell me about the importance of digital health and how you see it shaping the future of healthcare in Australia? Digital health is important because there's simply no alternative. You know, it's already been here for decades. It's been bringing about reform everywhere we look. Um, Health is just taking its time and we know why that's slow Mm. because it's hard. If it was easy, we would have taken care of matters by now. Mm. But it's already really shaped the landscape. I mean, if I look back on my career, the first clinical information system I used was at the Royal Children's Hospital in Brisbane in 1998. That was certainly by no means a first of its kind, but that was, I guess, you know, pretty life-changing for me because that had a real influence on sort of the direction I went in. But I think we also talk um, endlessly about having a more consumer focused health system Mm -hmm. but the way the health system's funded and governed you know it makes that really difficult to implement so Mm. you know you and I both know how we would like our interactions and our experience with the health interaction to be based on you know what's happened to us previously and our um, role as a consumer or a carer but I so I think when I think about the future it doesn't necessarily look that different to mm-hmm. now. It's just at scale. And I think, you know, there's already some health services that are doing great things that are really innovative, that are responsive to their communities, that work sort of in concert with, with patients and consumers, but they're just not ubiquitous. So mm-hmm. for me, the the sort of 
the future would be would be all of this kind of humming at scale. And I think we're sort of, you know, perhaps we'll endlessly be chasing our tails there, but bit by bit we're kind of chipping away. But um, it's it's sort of hard to stay in front of that. Yeah, so, it's such yeah. a complex yeah. landscape. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And I understand you are surrounded by healthcare professionals. Is quite yes. a pedigree um, in your immediate yes. And, yeah, distant family. So you're you're sort of dotting a few eyes and and crossing a few T's there. Yeah, it's it's part of the conversation. <laughs> so, are there any? I mean, you sort of have already touched on this a little bit, but are there any emerging trends that you find particularly important or uh, interesting, or you think will be impactful? And how do you stay on top of what those latest trends are? Mm, challenging. It's very challenging. I mean, I think obviously from an emerging trend perspective, AI is pretty hard to ignore. Mm. Um, and I think this is probably going to have, well, it, it will have significant impact. But, you know, we've been talking about it for years, but chat GPT obviously mm. brought it suddenly, you know, into the spotlight. And that's really, I think, brought the urgency from, you know, sort of all different sorts of perspectives. Um, you know, I've already referred to the, the sort of um, clinical digital assistant tool that Oracle's developing, but mm -hmm. I think that's a really good example of how AI can bring some significant improvements to um, clinician workflow mm. uh, and, you know, reduce some of those um, particular burdens. Mm. I, I think also another area where where there could be some emphasis, increased emphasis, is the use of synthetic data. Mm. So I think, you know, it's sort of essential really for providing timely access to sort of, well, real-world data. But, you know, we need to ensure it avoids re-identification, that it's, you know, appropriately representative of the communities it's serving so mm -hmm. that we're um, minimising or, or, or elimin eliminating bias uh, and that it's tested within the environments within which it's used and applied. So I think that could be a game changer um, because it's a significant gap, but that obviously still needs good governance and good process around it. I think... I'm not sure if you're aware, but last year the AAAIH published a national roadmap uh, around the implementation of AI in health. And I think that really sets out the pathway to sort of having a mature and coordinated national approach. Yes. So I think that, you know, the ingredients are there for it. It's just we we kind of need to need to get on um, and implement it. I think the other area of focus that's pretty exciting. Uh, is around standards. You wouldn't necessarily say standards and excitement in, in the in the same sentence, but it's obviously been a pretty yawning gap. But the, there's an initiative that the CSIRO has been leading um, around fire, about fire accelerator. It's a, it's called the Sparked Community, and, and they're making great strides in sort of building a sort of a core data set, which is already kind of, uh, I think it's already out for comment. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're sort of really great examples and certainly there's government support for those initiatives. So I think we're, we're kind of, you know, we're, we're slow to it, but, but, but we're getting there. I think in terms of how do you sort of stay on top of these things, I mean, it's, it's reading, 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 you mm. know, reading, 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 always just, yeah, there's kind of a, it's an untapped um, demand to sort of just, you know, you kind of hit with information. Yeah. Having, I guess, you know, there's different ways to consume that. Obviously you can, you know, there's articles, there's um, news, there's newsletters, there's podcasts like this one. Mm -hmm. um, podcasts, are, you know, can be a really excellent way to kind of consume information, um, bite-sized chunks mm. of info. And I think if you sort of stick with or have a few people that you've, you know, you kind of feel trust uh, a sort of trusted yes. advisor, if you will, um, without sort of trying to be, um, you know, sort of across everything. An expert because, in everything. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think that's just impossible. You know, we've all got kind of a, you know, a particular viewpoint. Um, we don't have to have every viewpoint. 
I think it's really important that you don't get too caught up in that uh, and you know when to refer or defer to others. Yes, yes, yeah. That's why the network's important. Yes, absolutely. Congratulations on receiving the Brilliant Women in Digital Health Award in 2021. How has this recognition impacted your work and what does it mean to you personally? Uh, I would say professionally it's pretty wonderful to be recognised by your peers, um, particularly alongside some, you know, incredible women who are real leaders in their respective fields. And I guess I'd also um, applaud Telstra Health for actually bringing the recognition Mm. for women in digital health through this award you know I was lucky to be in that sort of inaugural round but that was only 2021 so yes there aren't many other awards like that uh and also the judges who you know take their time to um to to make it happen I think personally I wish my dad had been around to see it he died just a few months before Mm. uh the awards were announced and he's always been my greatest champion and um biggest cheerleader and I know he would have been very proud to see that so yeah that's hard but it's yeah. nice to think of him being proud of you from another yes, world very, <laughs> very much so yes what future projects or goals are you really looking forward to uh I guess the future projects or goals I'm looking forward to are the ones that are sort of currently in development for me and ones that I have taken on since I started at Oracle Health. So I'm currently leading a piece of work for a very large health district in Melbourne, uh, which is looking to implement a health information exchange. And that's going to bring the ability for them to sort of share um, patient data across their boundaries and with organisations that they wouldn't normally have the ability to share with. So community, GPs, private providers, private hospitals, other public hospital facilities and so on. So that's that's going to be a, a really big innovation for them. Uh, and so that's coming later this year. We're sort of in that development phase for it now. And following that, we'll be working with them to implement their uh, population health platform. So I guess what's exciting for me there is that you start to, so the health information exchange will be this, bring the kind of a longitudinal record, uh, have access to information that you wouldn't otherwise have access to, but then, you know, growing that sort of, that rich profile of individuals into a profile of, of whole populations. So you know, health services get to understand better the patients that they are serving and then to, you know, provide treatment accordingly. So I think that's really the next frontier. It's being done, but yes. it's it's not being, again, being done at scale. So this will be, a, a, I think, certainly from this particular district, a, um, an Australian first. So that's, you know, that's pretty exciting, exciting. to me. With the increased integration of technology in healthcare, how do you address ethical considerations and ensure the security of health-related data in your hacking health initiatives? I guess the governance, you're big on that and it's through different governance. Governance is key, I think, because then the sort of the trust and the transparency can fall out of that. Uh, I think in Australia we're still missing that sort of more coordination and I referred earlier to the roadmap that the AAAIH has developed and that that gives us the sort of roadmap to to achieve that. But I guess the ultimately, you know, we need to be providing a, a safe, trust, a trusted and transparent environment and if we're doing we're open about what we're doing with people's data mm. and we're also seeking their consent and using it as uh, we've told them we will use it and and obviously protecting it. So I think most of us have been impacted in some way by some breach, whether mm. that be big or small. Um, we all know what that what that's like. So I think it's kind of incumbent upon all of us to be taking some responsibility that they're using the mechanisms we can but being thoughtful about it and thinking about it sort of up front. So it's not kind of something that you can just, you can tick off at the beginning mm. of a project. It's yes. got to be 
sort of it, it, it's it's got to be the thread it's got to be very much the yeah just just part of the part of the fabric of it yeah yeah it's that ongoing commitment isn't it absolutely yeah is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have uh, I don't think so I mean I think uh, it's great to have have the opportunity to speak with you today Sarah I think it's always really good to have a bit of a conversation about where things are at yeah um, and I guess it's it's such a well health the health health system is just a it's it's a giant beast and whatever we can do um together to sort of make that better i'm I'm a big fan of collaboration i know as pete birch likes to say you know collaboration starts with the conversation so yeah you know it's i i think that's that's kind of the you know my fundamental principle uh in life really perfect thanks for coming on today Great. Thanks for having me, Sarah. See you next time. See you next time. We're going to keep the conversation going in our private Facebook group, You Legal for Doctors. You're welcome to join us there.